and welcome to the 25th hour. My name is Atonga Ter. And I'm Nadine Youssef. This week we have been looking for the most fascinating residents and hidden gems of Ottawa. From Viking warriors to Canada's fastest painter, we bring you previously unheard stories from the people of the capital. Ottawa poet Apollo the Child had witnessed the power of words through his life. Through hard times, words became his light and his savior. Now spoken word is where he comes alive, his tool for self-discovery and expression. Only I lie with a painted smile and say I'm fine. So you can't see pain through this coat of paint. Now you can't see pain through my coat of paint. And I learned that science proves that Superman should be black. I tell people he was. I tell people. I am Apollo the Child and I am a spoken word artist. I loved hip hop, you know, my older cousins uh, introduced us to a lot of hip hop. So uh, they're like, yeah, I really love rap and everything. He's like, well, you should try writing. So I did. So I started writing and the writing was awful because I was like young and did not know what I was doing. Spoken word artist was like the coolest thing to me and I wanted to be one. I decided I was going to do the holiday assembly. So at first when I signed up, I signed up to do hip hop. And then everybody's like, oh, cool, you're going to rap. And I was like, ah, no. I'm gonna do some spoken word. To sit and write until our skulls and skies lit on fire. So I gave you the name of Johnny Blaze. I gave you the name of Johnny Blaze, and Johnny was a good Superman, and it figured. Everybody loved that, and I got a great reaction. And so I knew there was something there. I knew there was something there. I wish I can go back in time to when we realized we were both beings with big smiles, and we would try to outgrin each other, and the laughing fits that ensued. When you're young, you kind of don't want to be different you don't want to stand out like that at all, you know? A lot of children of immigrants now have kind of been learning that you kind of have two identities, two cultures. I didn't know where I belonged. If it wasn't for art, I don't think I would have made it through. You know, in the Middle East specifically, I know in other cultures as well, like there's a huge kind of stigmatization around it where um, and I know a lot of people in the community have kind of suffered through mental health issues and it's almost seen as something to be ashamed of. I'm so sorry it took me this long to speak of you. I'm just so tired of writing these eulogies. Another friend of mine actually passed away. She took her own life that year too, like literally right before school started and that kind of impacted a lot of us. My parents were really counting on me to get a university degree and then start really helping out with the family. I felt very alone. I felt like I was just a student number. Eventually I decided what was best for me would, was to drop out. Didn't run it by my parents. Um, was very, very afraid of what uh, they might think or what they might say. Uh, again, because like, it was a big responsibility and I did kind of crumble under that pressure. I dealt with my depression through art. My people, if you want me, say word. My people, if you with me, say a word. word. My people, if you with me, say love. love. There you go. The organizer was like, hey, come out to Urban Legends. Like, uh, it's going to be a bi-weekly show, but we are doing an open mic. Thank God the sun was just coming up. I walked to the bathroom. I learned a lot about myself, and I really came into myself because of you Urban know, Legends. I took over the directing ship of Urban Legends in 2014-15, uh, and I've been running it ever since. The once quiet, skinny, former Afro Samurai is now leader of the show we started slamming at. I say that with pride. I took my art nationally. I was a rapper first before I ever was a poet. I love music. I love music. So my brother and I, we have a radio show together at Carlton. Uh -huh. When I first kind of started doing it, I was, I, at that point, I've been performing for at least five years. And being on that mic, I was absolutely petrified. And then uh, eventually my older brother's like, hey man, like, just think of it as us having a conversation. I know that at the end of the day, if everything goes wrong, I know my family's there to hold me down and help support me, especially after opening up to my parents about my depression. We were polar opposites and yet the same. I go by Paula the Child, that's my artistic name, the name that I always bring to the stage. Um, when I was in 10th grade, I stumbled upon the section of the Greek god Apollo. And he was not only tasked in bringing the sun, he also ruled over the arts. We promised we would be spoken word. 
We promised we would build a community using words. And now I'm doing all that we talked about, all that we planned for, all that you gave me confidence My for. name is Khalifa Hamdan, and I am a spoken word artist. I'm standing at the edge of the world. Wow, what a dynamic young man. Painting is no longer a quiet individual craft. Alan Andre is at the forefront of the live speed painting trend in Ottawa, creating his paintings in front of audiences and winning battles across the country. Andre is currently Canada's fastest painter. My name is Alan Andre. I'm an artist, a speed painter, art battle champion, um, and storyteller in some ways. <laughs> um, I think I, I kind of always been a live painter at art because uh, I would draw at a young age and when I started getting good I actually started getting a little bit of attention from it so I kind of like fed off the bat a little bit so I know I'd be drawing and then strangers just would just kind of like leer over my drawings and I was very aware of that so I think that's where it kind of started but uh, my first live painting was probably a few years ago a friend of mine at Ottawa U had asked me to do a live painting for an event and I've always just done it like in my studio, just like a scientist in his lab and then show my creation. So it was kind of interesting and exciting to be able to do it in front of a whole audience of people. And when I showed up, there was like so many people. I was kind of like, whoa, like what did I sign up for? But it was, it was cool. And I think it was one of my best ones, my first one. So it just kind of took off from there. So the technique is like, I think it has to do with, um, for myself is like, freedom from certain constraints like so in the beginning when I first started um, I kind of would not focus too much on true colors and I would just kind of use the colors that I feel are cool <laughs> or where I think okay we need some pink here some green here and I'm doing like a face and it's like every color the rainbow I think my biggest influence is the art that's around me so like my mother loved paintings, always coming home with a new painting every other week um, and was really excited about them. And then I was really into comic books as a kid and cartoons and those definitely influenced my work. So a lot of comic book artists are some of my favorite artists. I've been doing this thing called Canvas Lounge Thursday at Grounded and we wanted it to be kind of like just an open place for creativity. It's exciting because like when you're in front of the canvas, um, no matter what you're doing, that's like the most present moment because you are focused, totally focused on trying to solve the problem in front of you, whether it's like, okay, what's wrong with this picture? Is the hair too big or the hands too small? You're trying to solve all these problems and balance it out. But you are present in that moment. You're not thinking about tomorrow. You're not thinking about yesterday. For me, I feel like it's, almost like a meditation. So uh, at Grounded, I created a giant mechanical thousand year bear from a story um, that Stephen King wrote uh, called The Dark Tower. So then we started pushing the limits, like I started making holes in the wall, like making the teeth come out, the claws come out. Then the contractor's like, we could bring in some trees and I'm just like, yes, let's do that. So he brought in some trees and you know, I helped place them and position them and stuff. And the most challenging aspects of live painting is just sometimes you forget <laughs> um, that you've been practicing your whole life and that you know, you're ready for it. Just the anticipation of what you're gonna come up with, um, I guess might be a little bit challenging, so it might make you a little bit nervous, but I feel like those nerves are actually good. It actually pushes you to even, to do better. So where I see myself with art and live painting is, uh, I just wanna improve like the quality of like, of what I do. I don't wanna limit myself to doing this only, but I think that's who I am. So yeah, I think I, I'll probably be doing it for a long time. Handcrafted Japanese kitchen knives are becoming ever more popular in the Ottawa restaurant scene. Chris Lord manages the Japanese knife store, Knifeware. Chris developed a passion for these knives and wants to make them accessible to everyone, from professional chefs to amateurs. 
when you're sharpening a knife, it, it's just about geometry, you know? It is like triangles are sharp. My name is Chris Lord. I am the store manager at Knifeware. Uh, we're a small shop in the Glebe in Ottawa, specializing in uh, Japanese kitchen knives. I've always been like a big nerd about things. Like I always want to learn as much as I could about something or, you know, get as many options as I, as I could about something. I used to be a chef. Uh, I, had grow, you know, developed a huge appreciation for good knives and, you know, the store popped out and I uh, needed a job. I'd say the most important things when you're sharpening is, is consistency. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm flattening the stones here. Um, you can't sharpen on a curved stone. It just won't work. We need to make sure that they're super flat. I have a lot of knives, um, but for me, I always wanted a handmade one, like one that I knew like a human worked on. I come at it from a performance standpoint that you're not going to find a sharper knife or a knife that holds its edge longer than one made in Japan. It's the only knife I made, so it does have a kind of a special, special place for me. So yeah, so I got to you know I did all the hammering myself, and then we um, we polished it a bit, we we tempered it. Um, the grinding was the hardest part, I think, for me. This guy is nice and even, and uh, it's got nice straight lines, and then mine is kind of crooked and a little wavy, right? You know, my knife doesn't look that pretty, but it, it works well. My, the first knife I bought from Knifeware was a, was a, a 240 millimeter um, Moritaka Kiritsuke. You know, it was like carbon steel. It's kind of harder to take care of. It could get rusty. But for me, it was, uh, I, just, I just always wanted one. Like if I played guitar, I'd probably have six or seven guitars. So I'm just that kind of person. I just, I get a little obsessive about those kind of things. There's a lot to learn here, you know, like I need to know what every knife is, who made it, what it's made out of, what shape is the handle, what's the handle made out of, how do you take care of it, what's it for, like there's a lot to know. So the first two months were kind of hard because then like, all right, so now I know about all the knives, now I need to learn how to sharpen them, now I need to know how, like there's just a lot, right? There's a lot of story involved with everything we have in the store. That's why we like the Japanese knives is because the harder the steel, the sharper the knives are going to get and the longer they're going to keep their edge, which really is what you want out of a knife, right? We meet all kinds of, you know, culinary professionals. Like there's line cooks from pubs. There's, you know, kind of world-class chefs, three-star chefs, guys from hotels, guys from small restaurants. Uh, they're all looking for, you know, different things. Like maybe the pub guys are just looking for something they can kind of knock around a bit, something kind of cheap, stainless steel, very easy to care for. Sweet, good to meet you. When you get into like the higher end places, maybe the chefs are a little showier. They want something that looks really cool or, um, you know, a fancy handle or patterning on the blade. Um, that's where a lot of like the big crazy knives end up are the restaurants where you get like the really showy chefs. You know, maybe it's an open kitchen and they want to show everyone them carving the giant piece of meat. I just wanted, you know, one that was mine, like one that I just kind of couldn't do without. One that I was going to use every day and kind of, as strange as it might sound, like develop a relationship with this tool. The 25th hour. Life is a battlefield, and a local Ottawa warrior is leading the charge through self empowerment. Get a glimpse into why people are turning to her for guidance. I've been a victim, we'll say, of various har sexual harassments and abuse in my life, and abandoned by my fiance at the time when I was pregnant. That caused me to have to reinvent myself and to really tap into the warrior strength to survive. As soon as I got my sword and my shield, it was like, oh, where have they been all my life? 
My name is Beth Sturdivant, and I am a shield maiden and founder and director of Warriors of the Light. Okay. So fully extend your shield. Yeah. Protect your hand. Okay. The Viking sword and shield training that we do really helped me to engage with the primal warrior energies that we have that we don't necessarily have to tap into or even get a chance to in our modern day society. That's it. Good. You want to have a go? After uh, the birth of my, my children and when, my, when their uh, father <coughs> left me, I started to take medication for depression and anxiety just to help me get through that period of my life. Yeah. And um, also suffering from PTSD as well from, from that period as well as postpartum. I'm very aware of this, the mental struggles that we can physically face. However, the more we're able to go inside and remove the blocks and remove the fear and f confront those aspects of our past that we'll say caused them, the more freedom we feel and the more strength we get over time. So I'll do a left hand for you, okay? Ready? So we go one, two, back, three, four. The women's only component of Warriors of the Light, so the Shield Maiden training, the goal is to help empower women, to help them connect with their warrior spirits mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, and to feel fiercer, to you know, combat the various obstacles that we will meet, and also to create a bond so that we feel like we're stronger together and that we can come together and, and really have a, a sense of a community and a, and a sisterhood. What really sort of clinched my decision to join the program was the idea that it had this component beyond the physical aspect. So the classroom component of, of going through different things, it just brings it all together and you make connections that you wouldn't necessarily do in just a straight up physical class. Does anyone have any questions or want to add anything, share? Using the sword and the shield in particular um, really helped to engage those elements of courage and strength. I studied professional um, classical music, but it wasn't um, so much a, a passion or a purpose as something that I did and I was good at. Yeah, so Pauline, yours is going to have to go underneath. There we go. That's it. That's it. Perfect. So the, the whole premise of this is we've got to stay tight, we're stronger together, we're you. The sense of purpose that I feel in doing this um, is what I've been searching for my entire life. Forward, one more time, we're going to go back, back, that's it, better girl, back, back, that's it, and back. Forward, 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 forward. It is the utmost honor um, for me to be able to really uh, birth this and continue to, to help it grow. It's amazing how an ancient form of fighting can be so useful today. Scott Taylor was a soldier, then a war correspondent. Now he is a magazine entrepreneur. Founding Esprit de Court Canadian military magazine allowed him to tell the real stories from conflicts worldwide. Now he shares the story of how he came to be one of Canada's most outspoken defense critics. As a kid, I was always involved in reading about military history. I was fascinated with it. And my father had collected military miniatures and he was just like too young for World War II, so he was fascinated with the whole aspect of, you know, sort of reading about history. I'm Scott Taylor, a former soldier. I graduated from the College of Art and wanted to take on a personal challenge. I wanted to see if, you know, before I entered into my lifetime career of art, which was my illustration background was gonna be, um, I wanted to see if I had what it took kind of thing. So I wanted to become a paratrooper. I wanted to become a commando. Started the Esprit de Corps magazine in 1988. Uh, have been doing that uh, as a publisher and then working for other agencies as a war correspondent for the past three decades. It was this idea that, I mean, if we're gonna do the stories, why would I let someone else go and do the adventure? 
if it's not going to be me, like if it's going to be a trip to Namibia or to wherever to go up into the Arctic, why would I want to hire a journalist when I want to do that? Now I could do Air Force or Navy stuff and I got to go to sea and I got to go on submarines and I could do things that I'd never been able to do. So for me, it was this ticket to adventure galore. As a soldier, we always had a field message pad, which I use to keep track of everything from uh, contacts in the field, people who were there, to uh, the day-to-day -day sort of diary, initial diary that we've got, that we put together. Um, and this is accumulated over various trips uh, over the years. So these things were handy at the time and then certainly proved to be um, an excellent kind of way to recapture but what that was, the immediacy of what was happening there. So this particular diagram was from the uh, Russian counter-invasion in 2008. So for me, sometimes it's taking a combination of my art background as a, as a student and then my soldiering experience to take things and then try to actually visualize them. I, mean, I spent years and years covering war zones and as a soldier, it's one of those things where you believe yourself to be invulnerable. Like you can't sort of, um, ever think about what if it's gonna to happen to you. You always think it's gonna to happen to somebody else. And I had 20 trips into the north of Iraq and you know, thought I knew it, or that I was experienced or that I would you know, always be able to talk my way out of it or whatever else. And, and then I learned in uh, September 2004 that that isn't always the case. And I became, all of a sudden realized, you know, this is, this is it. <laughs> There's no talking your way out of this one which, I mean, I, I sit here, so obviously now that I did happen, I did survive it, but it was a, a brutal captivity. It was uh, five days, and myself and my Turkish colleague were, uh, and we were tortured, beaten. I mean, there's a whole range of emotions even when you're a captive. I mean, you don't just sit there all day just shaking in fear. I mean, there's things that happen that are actually funny, even in retrospect, when it, like, it, it's just, um, life happens, right? It's just so, you, you can't just sit and quake for five days. Like, um, there's moments of intense terror, and then there's other moments where, you know, some of the food actually wasn't too bad. Very quickly, the minute we started to express actual opinion, there was a whole censorship issue with D&D. &D. Their first reaction to any kind of criticism was to kill it. They weren't just gonna challenge it or refute the argument, they were gonna crush the magazine. It, it started, what went on for probably more than a decade of us, it became at one point a very, very vicious fight between us and the, the senior brass where we were targeting corruption. And uh, I mean, that's something which, in retrospect, I mean, it was one hell of a fight. They practically bankrupted us for a long, long stretch, but we accomplished a lot. We stayed the course, the culture changed, and so has the relationship between us and the senior brass. Never would have foreseen it being what it is 30 years later. Starting the magazine, it wasn't about a journalism kind of quest, but this sort of got pushed upon us. Like even the, um, what was originally adventure stories about the military became stories about corruption, which we didn't even know existed, but we ended up leading the fight. I mean, I never would have thought, I mean, I never per ever looked at a career making films or writing books or I guess, subsequently being a magazine publisher. I was an illustrator by training and probably one day when all this is over, I'll go back to painting landscapes or something. But uh, for now, I mean, it's, we got at least another good decade. And you are watching the 25th hour. not-for-profit dance collective in Ottawa is trying to spread positivity through the community, one beat at a time. Celebrating their 20th anniversary this year, Culture Shock Ottawa is growing like never before. Artistic director Laura Braid brings us closer to her lively dance collective. My name is Laura Braid. I'm the artistic director for Culture Shock Ottawa. I'm um, the one who's coordinating and running all the rehearsals, so determining what kind of training are we going to do with our team, what do they need. On top of that, it's putting together all of our sets and performances, so um, either choreographing and teaching myself or obviously having a lot of our team members contribute to our sets and our, uh, our medleys as a whole in general. Yeah. 
Culture Shock is a nonprofit organization. Uh, our main mandate is to provide youth outreach programs, particularly for communities at risk, but for communities all over the city. Uh, we really have like three pillars as an organization, uh, nonprofit. It's to educate, enrich, and entertain. I've been doing urban dancing for the last seven years. I kind of stumbled upon it. I actually, by mistake, went to take a hip hop drop-in class. Uh, I messed up my scheduling and ended up going anyway. Uh, and I actually fell in love with it pretty well from that first class. The movement itself is so beautiful. There's so much freedom. When all the lights are off and you're just getting set up and you hear the crowd, and then as soon as the music and the lights come on, it's like, wow. When I'm teaching, I prepare for classes kind of in a few different uh, ways. Wherever I am, whether I'm just at home or I'm commuting somewhere to work or elsewhere, I will listen to my music like on repeat, basically, and I'm visualizing myself teaching the class and doing the choreography. When you see people performing your own piece, uh, whether it's in class, on stage, whatever, it is really such an incredible feeling. It is so rewarding. It's, it's seeing a vision that just started maybe as an idea or a thought come to life. It's a really uplifting and inspiring thing. I get my inspiration from a lot of places. Honestly, my biggest source is really the people that I dance with every week. It's my teammates, 110%. But you know, on top of that, um, I'm an avid dance video watcher. I watch YouTube all the time. Tony Zarr is an incredible artist who really inspires me, his messages, his movement, everything. The word family is sometimes very often loosely thrown around. But truly, I wholeheartedly believe in culture shock being a family. The people and the relationships that I have uh, been able to foster and, and gain through being with culture shock are some of the most valuable relationships I have in my life. We're a dance team, but first we're a family. You can be doing something and mess up or look like a fool or whatever. If you're freestyling, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. You do something weird and people will still be like, you're amazing and cheer for you and scream for you. And, um, it's just so much love and support. Sometimes it's not always like your blood, it's the people you choose to be around and who choose to be around you. I definitely would not have taken a lot of the risks that I have in my, in my dance career, in my regular life, if it weren't for them. Sustainability and recycling are not often associated with skateboards. Working at a desk during the day, environmental engineer Andrew Zito found his calling making wooden art from old skateboards by night. He uses his passion for skateboarding by donating some of his earnings to kids who can't afford to skateboard. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, hi, I'm Zito. I make stuff out of skateboards. And today we're going to be making a knife. This thing. Whoosh, the knife itself and stuff. So I've been working like woodworking stuff probably like two years now. Um, it actually all started because of this place that we're at right now, the Ottawa City Wood Shop. I honestly didn't even know what like a bandsaw was before then, so I would also these guys. I kind of really liked the idea of woodworking and stuff and doing something with my hands. That was really it. Uh, I work behind a computer all day, every day, most days. So being able to make things with your hands and kind of you know, be active in that sense was kind of really why and how I started it. The materials I use are, as you see with most products, it's skateboards. Um, I get them from all the skate shops in town, but primarily Burling uh, on Somerset there. And we actually design the boards now. Every board they put out, we'll kind of go and talk about the plies that are going to go into every board so that, you know, there's the understanding that there's that, you know, secondary life cycle that, that comes with this product and it won't just go to the landfill. 10% of revenues uh, go back into the At For Pivot Sake program and also the uh, Girl Skate 613 program in the Ottawa community. Um, they help build skate parks, they help uh, provide um, training and skateboarding and programming to underserved communities and then uh, we also 
are doing a hope, you know, trying to bring all sorts of minorities and diversify skateboarding and what it is in this particular city. So, hoping to do good things. My background is actually in environmental engineering. You know, the whole aspect of trying to be sustainable is pretty near and dear to my heart. So um, being able to bring skateboards, refurbish them, basically pulling something from the trash and building them into hopefully beautiful products, um, yeah, it's quite nice. Uh, my staples right now are um, paddles, actually. So paddles, they're like kind of chevron styled. They're like feather styled, but um, skateboards embedded into walnut, ash, cherry, what have you. It's, uh, yeah, that's kind of like what I make. I make a couple of those a week and stuff. Um, outside of that, uh, what am I making? There we go. Man, pretty much just a little bit of everything. Bowls, coffee campers. I made a baseball bat. That was super friggin' wicked. We hit a home run with that. That was super fun. And uh, I don't know, future projects include like hockey sticks and stuff. So we'll kind of see. I don't know, all sorts of stuff. end up with this, uh, which is going to be our finished product. A um, little notch here that really fits your index finger in there quite well. Everybody, their children, their grandmother, my mom especially these days, is on their phone and, you know, kind of pretty heavily always behind a digital screen. When you're here, it's game on, you know. Here's the saw that can chop you up in all sorts of different bad ways and things like that, but it can also make incredible, beautiful things in, in my eyes. Right, so um, it's focused, it's, it's, it's tangible, it's in your hands, and uh, it's not behind a computer screen. So that's really, yeah, what I love about being here and making things. And that's it for this week on the 25th Hour. During this show, we have brought you a flavor of the Capitals culture. Make sure to watch again next time for more of Ottawa's weird and wonderful stories. From all of us here at the 25th Hour, thank you for watching and goodbye.